will continue to join as we get things rolling. Um, but good afternoon. Thanks for joining the Health Links webinar series. Um, I'm Kaylee Rivera. I am the Community Engagement and Trainings Manager for Health Links, and I'm excited to bring this webinar series to you. Um, today we have the topic office office ergonomics, which seemed to be quite popular when um, people were sending in their comments and responses and registering. So I'm really looking forward to it. Um, before we get into the presentation, just wanted to refresh on our HealthLinks benchmarks. And this is um, the standard that we use and where we try to categorize our webinars into to hopefully provide resources and the various benchmarks to help you achieve total worker health. And today's webinar actually falls within both health policies and programs and safety policies and programs. And um, I'm looking forward to kind of learning more about how generally thinks we can incorporate some movement and um, diff different ergonomic techniques into our day to help break it up and prevent any sort of strains and injuries. As usual, um, these are our housekeeping items, so everyone is going to be kept on mute throughout the duration of the presentation, um, but if you have a question, just use the chat box in the control panel, um, and we will answer that. We'll likely keep most of them till the very end, but I'll be monitoring it, and if I think it's something that should maybe chime in at that moment, I'll go ahead and um, interrupt Jenna Lee and see if she can address the question. Um, again, the webinar is being recorded, and we always share the link to the recording along with a copy of our slides in a follow-up email, and you can always access the recording by first checking our online resource center on our website, healthlinkcertified.org, or finding our YouTube page if that's um, your preferred method of looking for it, and that is Health Links Colorado. Um, at the end of the presentation, I will be sending an email. Um, I should have corrected this slide. I'll be sending you a quick email. It just has a 10 point scale. If you can rate the webinar to your liking, that would be very helpful for us. And we're um, trying to simplify the evaluation process. So if you see that come through, it should take you know 10 seconds to select a, a number and um, rate the webinar. So with that, I would like to introduce Janalee Thompson. Um, she is a safety and industrial hygiene professional for the city and county of Denver at Denver Public Works um, and my former colleague. So very happy to have you here. Um, she did complete her graduate studies in 2017 at CSU in environmental health with a specialization in occupational ergonomics and safety. Janely recently published her master's thesis, Occupational Physical Activity in Brewery and Office-Based Workers in the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Hygiene, based on her primary focus in graduate school on physical activity in office-based workers. After graduating, she came and worked with us at the Colorado School of Public Health at the Center for Health, Work, and Environment, and there she researched total worker health and advised organizations on best practices associated with health promotion and health protection. Janely now uses an interdisciplinary approach to improve total worker health and workplace efficiency through measurement, training, and evaluation at Denver Public Works. In her spare time, Janelle enjoys riding her horse, teaching yoga, and hiking with her two dogs. So thank you so much for being here, Janelle. I'm excited to get into your presentation. I am going to go ahead and relinquish control to you, and um, we can move forward. Great, thank you very much for having me. Well, I'm excited to um, speak to you all today about um, occupational ergonomics, and I'd like for you to come away from this presentation with tools that you can use um, right away, right after this presentation, to increase uh, physical activity um, in your office life, if that's what you primarily do. So just to give you a brief overview, um, I'll talk to you about ergonomics, um, what the definition of that looks like, um, technology in the workplace, um, what health looks like at work. Um, and then we'll talk about some solutions such as sitting and standing. Um, I know standing desks are pretty popular right now, so we'll get into that a little bit. Um, we'll also talk about occupational physical activity, um, some wrist and hand health, um, and some recommendations that you can take away.
Okay, so first off, I'd like to start by talking about ergonomics and what it is. So a lot of times when people hear that I studied ergonomics in graduate school and that's what I practice daily, they're like, oh, office furniture, right? That's what you design. And um, that's not necessarily the case, um, though that is a component. So ergonomics is how people interact with their work environment. So as you can imagine, that can be a variety of different work environments, including the office. So there are human factors components, um, a lot to do with design, which we'll talk about um, a little more. And then safety is also a large component. So you will find ergonomists, um, or what they're called, um, in many different workplaces. Um, we're present in manufacturing. Um, you can see here there's the conveyor belt um, with some people um, putting together um, an object. Um, you'll also see ergonomists in meat packing industries. Um, this is a chicken manufacturing facility or chicken production uh, facility. And then in the automobile industry as well. So you can see in this variety of industries like construction and even the office, um, every workplace is different, right? So ergonomics is not just tailored to office workers, though that's what we'll primarily be speaking to today. Um, but just so you, that you know, moving forward, um, you can take these skills and ergonomics into any workplace um, and be successful. Okay, so I'd like to start off by talking about technology and health at work. So we're all familiar with technology. Um, I'm sure that y'all have smartphones. Um, we use computers daily, laptops. Um, that's great, right? Technology has made our workplace so convenient because you know we can take it on the road with us. Um, maybe some of us have the uh, novelty of working from home one day a week. Um, that's so great, but um, you know the caveat to that is that technology keeps us pinned to our desk, right? Or pinned into one central location. So as you can see here um, in this picture, you know, she has her dual monitor and then she's here at her desk, but technology is really keeping her, whereas maybe, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, she would have been out walking a manufacturing floor rather than working in an office. Okay, so this picture right here in the center, um, I don't have it here to demonstrate evolution, but merely to demonstrate how we've, uh, where we've come, right? We started as very active individuals, and then um, we're like, okay, we can sit and have this technology with us, and now we're understanding um, some of the health risks associated with sedentary behavior. So ergonomists or aspiring ergon ergonomists like myself um, have developed solutions such as standing desks, um, to offset um, some of those adverse health effects. So um, from sedentary, from being sedentary um, in your workplace, or even if you're sedentary, you know, in your non-work life, um, that can lead to many adverse health um, effects, such as heart disease, cancer, early mortality, um, diabetes, um, really the list goes um, on and on. So I'd like to start out by just giving you some health statistics to lay the foundation for um, where we're headed with this presentation. So only one in five adults are meeting physical activity guidelines. Um, so this is outlined by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, so their physical activity guidelines aren't even very stringent. Um, it just recommends that you have 120 minutes of um, anything over a brisk walk um, for your cardio per se, let me put that in quotations, and, um, and then two days devoted to muscle skeletal strengthening activities. So you, as you can tell, there's a lot of gray area in that. So it doesn't take very much activity to meet those physical activity guidelines. You know, so to me, um, you know, it's just saddening to hear that only one in five adults are actually meeting those guidelines. Um, so over 35% of adults are considered clinically overweight. Um, and it's expensive. The cost of US obesity is $147 billion. Medical expenses um, for obese people are about $1,500 higher than medical expenses um, for people of a normal weight. Um, and then Perry and Straker um, reported um, this in their study from 2013. People who are physically active for seven hours or more per week have a 40% lower risk of early mortality. Um, so let me just leave you with that and then we'll move forward. Okay, so Katz Marzik um, conducted a mortality study um, in 2010, and they found from their calculations that if we got everyone in the US to sit less, our population life expectancy would be two years higher. 
So I'm sure that you guys have heard the term uh, sitting is the new smoking and um, that was coined by a Mayo Clinic uh, physician um, who found or was seeing in his patients that were primarily sedentary or clinically um, obese or overweight that the health effects of sitting were just as detrimental as um, the adverse health effects of smoking. So, um, so you can see where there's, um, where, how this is very important. So let's talk about what's happening um, when you're sitting. So um, I'm sure a lot of you maybe can relate to the picture um, on the left of the screen. It's a guy kind of hunching over his computer. Even I am guilty of that sometimes, and I know the adverse health effects of sitting. So let's dig a little deeper. Okay, so the picture on the left um, is a normal spine, right? So you've got the cervical curve, thoracic curve, lumbar curve, pelvic curve. Now I'm not asking you to memorize those curves, but more um, look at the angles and the shape of the spine, right? That's a nice healthy spine, has a lot of shape and curvature to it, especially that lumbar and cervical curve that's known as a lordotic curve. So those are both lordotic curves. And then where you see the thoracic curve, that's a kyphotic curve. Okay, now look at the picture over on the right side of the screen, um, which just shows the internal, like an internal snapshot of someone who's sitting and typing at their desk. So I'm sure that you can see from this picture that the spine does not have any of the characteristics or those curves that we just discussed, like the picture on the left does. Um, so what that does to your body is it weakens your core, right? So it's so much more than not only, um, you know, training your spine essentially to have a dysfunctional shape, but it's also weakening your muscles, right? So you have a weakened core because you're hunching forward, leaning over your computer. And a lot of what we have, you know, with technology, it's very forward facing, right? We act in a very 2D um, lifestyle. So we're, wherever our screen is, we have a tendency to lean in toward that object, get closer to the screen, closer to that YouTube video, whatever it is that you're watching. Um, but you're also overstretching your back line. So what I mean here is um, your paraspinals, erector spinae, and QLs. So that's just the back line of your body. Oops, sorry guys, I don't know how that happened. Here we go. Okay, so what you're doing is overstretching your backline muscles, right, which I just mentioned, and then you're reducing that lumbar curve. So that lumbar curve, um, just to remind you from the last slide, is that curve in your low spine, right? And then also look at your neck here. Your neck should also have that curve, that lordotic curve. So we're missing that curve here when you're sitting and crouching forward, but you're also missing it here in your low spine as well. Um, and then also by hunching forward, scrunching, you know, you're weakening your core, you're tightening your pectoral muscles. So your chest essentially is tightening by reaching your arms forward and constantly contracting it. Um, but also it comes to your breath, right? We have this tendency, especially in, um, in our culture, to revert to the shallow chest breath, right? Um, so we aren't deepening our breath, breathing deep into our lungs because we're hunching forward and then adopting the shallow breath. But also, um, it plays a role in circulation as well. You know, your circulation isn't as efficient or your blood flow isn't as efficient when you're crouching into this position. Um, also, tight hip flexors, um, they're right here where the mouse is. Um, weak glutes, um, because you're sitting um, throughout your day and then your sit bones are just constantly stabbing into your muscles and weakening um, your glute muscles. Um, the tightening your hamstrings because they're constantly contracted because you're bending your knees, maybe you're pulling your heels up. So tightening your hamstrings and then uh, conversely, your quads are on top, so you're lengthening your quads. So it's just kind of like tightening everything on the front line, lengthening everything on the back line. Okay, now I'd just like you to take a moment um, to apply what we've talked about. So what do you think you can do to offset the negative effects of sitting? I'm um, gonna just take this opportunity, um, just a couple moments um, to write any questions that you have in the chat box or um, great ideas that you have to offset the negative effects of sedentary behavior. All right, we will revisit that later and let's move forward. Sorry, Jenny, there, um, oh. there is one, let me. Um, oh, hi, just saw a comment. It was sounding a little bit glitchy. Um, 
on my end, it's not. Can people chime in if that's still kind of sounding off? Um, and while we're waiting for those responses, people were saying um, go for walks or stretch during the day, get up every hour, um, sit stand desks have been an amazing addition to their office, using the stairs, um, and treadmill desk. Yeah, I love all of those ideas. See, so you don't necessarily need an ergonomist to come up with these fantastic ideas. I love it. So um, now I'm just going to take the opportunity to keep moving forward and then we can address more of these um, later throughout the presentation. So let's start by talking about sitting first. Here we go. All right, so you don't necessarily need something fancy like this guy has right here. And that's something, especially a lot of organizations, you know, can be blinded to as they see something fancy like this and, oh, you know what, I need the newest and greatest improvement um, for my employees. But then we also have a desk like this, right? Or a chair like this. Um, you know, it looks like a regular, ordinary chair, but then you can sit down and scrunch forward. Um, but then what we learned in the last slide, what do you see here, right? It still encourages that forward-facing behavior, that tightening of your pectorals, that leaning forward and reducing that lordotic curve in your neck and lumbar spine. And then here, here's a popular one, especially for architects. Um, I'm not sure what industry y'all are from. I'm happy to answer more specific questions to that later in the presentation. Um, but here, right? So look, there are some knee supports. Um, we've got some support for the glutes, but I don't necessarily see anything to support the spine. And then it's still encouraging that behavior to lean forward. And then here, these are pretty popular right now, yeah, um, even in my office, these um, exercise balls. Um, but what you can see here is it's a pretty unstable surface. Okay, so we'll revisit those in just a moment, but um, I found this um, online and I thought that it was a pretty good representation of what to look for um, from your chair and from your desk um, as you're working throughout your day, whether you work um, you know, in an office or at home, um, these are great tips that you can use. Okay, so let's start with the foundation, right? So looking at the chair here, um, something that's desirable um, in the foundation of a chair um, are five prongs that stick out. So that adds more stability, and especially if it has wheels, which it should if it's a five prong, um, it adds the mobility of the chair, um, but stability is a major player there. Um, then here, you. The more adjustable a chair is, um, the better off you'll be, right? Because every person is built differently, but the chairs are only built to um, what we say is 95% of the average population. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I'm not average. I'm about five foot four. Um, and you know, a lot of these chairs are built for people that are quite a bit taller than me. So I like a chair that has a lot of adjustments, you know, and it can work the opposite with someone who's very tall. They also need a chair with adjustments so that um, it can personalize to their fit. Okay, so we started with the foundation. We have the five, five prong on the chair. Um, we'd like to see this part be adjustable, the stem from the seat pan um, to the prongs, um, depending on your height, right? I'm very short, so I like this low to the ground. Someone taller may want this higher. Um, so the seat pan here, um, so your glutes and your hamstrings are resting on the seat pan. You want the seat pan to sit about a half inch behind your knee or just gently resting behind it. And then your feet here, you can see that her feet are flat on the ground. Um, her knees have about a 90 degree bend. The seat, uh, the seat pan here is about a half inch behind her knees. So that looks good. Um, now let's move to her lumbar spine. So that lordotic curve, remember here, that curve matches the curve in your neck. You want a chair that has enough support for your lumbar spine just to encourage your body to sit up and then stretch through your upper body. And then here, so you just want that low back support. And even if your chair just doesn't make those adjustments, um, what I like to tell people is, you know, grab a small pillow, grab a small blanket, something that's not very thick, but provides just enough support for your low spine to encourage you to sit up straight. Um, and then we'll drive up to um, her shoulders. Shoulder blades need to be pulled down and back just to promote that widening of her collarbones, opening through her front line. Um, your elbows here, and this is really the only thing that I 
do not like about this picture um, are her elbows, right? I think that the bend in her elbows is good. A 90 degree bend is what you would like to work toward, um, but there aren't any supports for her arms. Um, and as you can see, this chair here, I'm sure it's a limitation of the design of the chair, but it isn't adjusted so that these armrests um, just sit directly below her elbows. Now, you don't want your armrests so high that you're scrunching your shoulders up toward your ears, but just a comfortable rest for your forearms as you're reaching forward to type. And um, then your screen, a good rule of thumb is your screen should be about an arm's width distance away from your face, um, give or take a few inches. So you can just do that easily, extend your arm out forward. If the screen is um, just out of reach of your fingertips, it's the right distance. Um, another helpful tip is having your objects um, that you use pretty often, such as water bottles or pens or pencils, um, fairly close to your work area to avoid uh, leaning forward and adopting awkward postures. So then with that being said, you know, if you have dual monitors or you have the type of desk where you where it's at an angle or a 90 degree bend and your screen is one direction and maybe your paperwork is a different direction and you often twist to access that other part of your desk, just try to avoid twisting with your seat facing forward. Um, and what I mean by that is when you turn to twist or access another part of your desk, just make sure your entire body is turning. That's why your seat is mobile, right? So you want your seat pan to be able to shift with you. And if that doesn't make sense, um, feel free to shoot me a question and I'll clarify that in more detail. Okay, so here are some uh, tips that I have for sitting. Um, ensure that you have some lumbar support for your seat, right? That little backrest. It doesn't have to be the design of your chair, although it is preferable that way, but a small pillow or a light blanket can also do the job. Um, your feet need to be place comfortably on the ground. Like I said, I'm pretty short. So when um, chairs aren't adjustable, you know, I can even swing my feet. My feet won't touch the ground. Um, if you have that problem, just make sure you find a chair that's adjustable for you or maybe even stack your feet um, on a book if that's not an option to adjust your chair. Um, conversely, if you're a tall person, um, try to find a good fit for you. Um, the bottom of your chair, so the seat pan, you want that to rest comfortably behind your knee or your calf, and you want your gaze straight ahead, right? So I always say you want your whole heart working toward or your attention into what you're doing, right? So you don't want to twist. You want your whole body to turn and have your full attention to avoid that twisting motion. Um, if you do have to twist or as you're turning, just make sure you hug your low belly up and in to engage your core to support your low spine before you do so. And honestly, I think that's a great rule of thumb because you're strengthening your core muscles and then training your body to have good posture as you're accessing different parts of your desk. Um, I already mentioned this, avoid twisting to look at your computer, full body faces, whatever it is you're working on. Um, the more adjustable knobs that your chair has, usually the better. Um, I have seen some chairs that have overdone it or over designed with too many knobs and adjustments, um, but just take those tips that we worked through. You know, we worked from her um, feet all the way up to her head. Um, and as long as your chair can just adjust those um, components, your feet are resting on the ground, you have low back support, um, some arm rest support, um, and then uh, gentle back support, um, you'll be better off that way. So some chairs I've seen, um, or the other day I was doing an ergonomic assessment and um, one individual bought a chair. He's like, oh, it's great. I can relax and it reclines back. But unfortunately, the chair um, in its standard setting um, was reclined too far back. And in fact, he didn't have enough um, shoulder support. So you don't need much, just enough to encourage you to sit up straight and have good posture. And finally, relax your shoulders. Um, I know we all have this problem. Um, I like to call it tech neck. When you're sticking your chin out, leaning forward at your computer, and you're pulling your shoulder blades or your shoulders up to your ears. Um, sometimes I even do it um, without even thinking about it. So it's just being mindful about how you're sitting. And you know, be gentle with yourself because sometimes you can be like, okay, I just need to be sitting up straight like a stick the whole time. It's not necessarily the case. It's okay to kind of move and adjust your posture, and then you'll eventually train yourself just to have good posture um, for about 95% of your day when you're sitting. Okay, so let's talk about standing. 
Okay, so um, you, you don't have to answer this in the chat, but I'd just like you to think about um, these standing desks. So I'll show you a few different pictures and uh, maybe think and consider um, what you like about the standing desk option or the standing features and maybe what you don't like. So here we can see she has a footrest. Um, she's got a little keypad that comes out here. Um, I don't really see any arm support, um, but she's got a mouse, a dual monitor. And then next here, um, I think this is a pretty interesting contraption. Um, she's got a footrest. She has the option to stand, of course, if she'd like to. It's just a small area that might be kind of slick or slippery. Um, but then also she's got a little seat right here, um, though I don't see any lumbar support um, or armrests for her. And then here, oh, I'm so sorry that this other picture is blocking it, but what he's standing on is, um, if you know what a BOSU ball is, it's a mini BOSU ball. So it's flat on the bottom and then on the top, it's just like a rubber exercise ball. So it's like a half moon shape. Um, so that's what he's standing on. He has one foot on solid ground, one foot on the ball, and then he's just rotating which leg is on the ball and which leg is not. And then finally, we have the treadmill desk. So um, these are fairly popular as well, but I will say treadmill desks are very expensive and we don't necessarily need them. That's one thing um, that I would probably put into the over design category. Um, and it's frustrating for people who adopt the treadmill desks because they'll find that, oh yes, I got this treadmill desk, it's so wonderful, but now I can't do my work because my head is shaking as I'm walking and it's hard for me to concentrate. So I say this, um, if your organization has treadmill desks or is interested in incorporating treadmill desks, I think that they're great. Um, but you have to give yourself a three month learning period um, to, to learn how to adjust and, and read off of your screen um, because it can be um, pretty challenging at first. Um, so with the other thing said, now I'd just like to recap of these pictures. I think that they all have um, great components about them. So I'll start with the picture in the bottom right with this foot stand. Um, that's wonderful. Um, if, you just ha if you have the opportunity to work um, at a standing workstation, great. Um, if you have the foot rest, even better. Because you know, your legs get tired, so one leg will need to rest, the other can work, and then vice versa, you can alternate which leg um, is doing the work. Um, with the picture um, with the woman in the leopard dress sitting back into her chair, um, once again, I just think that's an over design. I don't think that you necessarily need that. If you have a standing desk, um, you know, you could also have a chair or a stool that would do the same job, and maybe um, you could incorporate a foot stand. Um, with the gentleman um, that has the BOSU ball component, um, that's also good. He's incorporating a little bit of physical activity into his workday, but also I anticipate if he was doing that all day, his legs would become pretty fatigued um, by the end of the day or the end of his shift. Okay, so here are some good tips for standing. Um, it's good to have a foot rest if you have the opportunity to stand throughout your, uh, your work day. Um, but it's also important to equally distribute your weight. Um, as we talked about, you know, if you have the foot rest, then one leg is doing all of the work, right? So that puts pressure on whichever hip joint that is that you're cocking your hip off to the side, especially women have a tendency to do that. So it's okay to do that, just be mindful and engage your muscles. So they're called your lateral stabilizers. So you can just go ahead and touch the outside of your thigh. That's what you want to engage as you're standing. So what that does is it just adds support um, for your hip joints and adds stability. Um, but it's also important to vary your standing position. You know, you just don't want to stand like a stick for the majority of your day. It's okay to, you know, rest one foot than the other vary how you stand, you know, maybe you lean forward for a little bit, lean back, lean to the side. That's perfectly fine. I actually encourage that. Um, and then also if you have the opportunity to um, purchase an anti-fatigue mat, um, those are wonderful as well. Um, so those provide support. Imagine how hard it is, um, and a lot of office spaces have that. Um, the floor is concrete, right, or some very hard material. Um, that can be pretty fatiguing um, for your joints and for your legs, especially if you're just dumping into your joints, not engaging your muscles. Um, just be sure to, to use your anti-fatigue mat. Um, try not to forget about it. Um, even people that have standing desks, um, they forget about um, that important component. So having that, that mat is also essential. And they're fairly inexpensive as well. Okay, so then, oops, hold on one second. Screen changed. 
Okay, so then here I'm, I don't think that it's necessary to put measurements on the exact distance that your screen should be away from your face. Um, I like to give you tools um, that you can use right away and you don't have to think back, oh, what did she say that measurement was? Um, just remember, screen away from your face about an arm's width distance. You want your screen directly in front of your face, so just take notice if you're looking up or down at your computer, you just may need to adjust it so the center of your screen is at the center of your eyes or the center of your face. Okay, and then elbows, it's good whether you're sitting or whether you're standing, um, to have them at about a 90 degree bend um, and have some support to rest um, your elbows, right? So if you're standing, um, I understand if it's um, hard to, to have an armrest for that, we can talk about some uh, recommendations um, to address that issue later if you have those questions. For sitting um, for your chair, I do recommend having the armrest for your chair. Um, and then we mentioned this before, a 90 degree bend into your knees, feet are flat um, on the ground, and your seat, ba seat pan sits uh, directly behind your calf or your knee, and five prong seat. Okay, and it doesn't have to be expensive. You don't have to have a standing desk. And um, these are just some do-it-yourself um, options that I found online. I've even done this myself um, when I was in grad school and I couldn't afford a standing desk. Um, I was stacking my desktop or my screen or my laptop um, on books or boxes. Um, these are just some options for you to take away here. Um, and you can rest, just rest your keyboard on top of those boxes. Um, but like I said, the most important thing is that your screen is arms with distance away and that you're staring directly into the center of your screen. Um, so with that said, um, you know, I get a lot of questions about, okay, well, is staring at my screen bad for my eyes? Well, you know, if you were referring back to that picture we looked at at the beginning of the presentation, um, the evolution picture of, you know, in terms of physical activity, well, you know, we haven't always stared at screens, right? And we're adapting um, to that. But um, an optometrist told me, um, his recommendation was, okay, as you're looking at your screen for every 20 minutes of screen time, go ahead and look away for 60 seconds and find something you know, far away, like a tree branch, or even maybe try to find a leaf, um, just to pull your attention and your eyes away from the screen, rest your eyes. You can even close your eyes if you don't wanna stare at something in the distance and then bring your attention back to your uh, computer. Janelle, is it okay to ask a quick question? Yeah, of course. Um, so I think two slides back, this is referring to, um, the question is, are you looking at the top of your screen when sitting and the middle of the screen when standing? Oh, I see what this picture looks like. Thank you so much for pointing that out. I never realized that um, this illustration was that way. This right here with the sitting individual is incorrect. This screen should be lifted to the height of the standing person's screen. So you want your eyes to be facing the middle of your screen in both instances. Uh, does that make sense? Yes, definitely. And I, I saw a couple people asking um, just if they'll get a copy of the final presentation. And yes, you, you will. And we are recording it and it'll be on our um, Health Links Resource Center as well. Great. Okay. So should you stand or should you sit? Is one better than the other? So you don't have to answer in the chat. I will answer it for you. Um, a combination of both is best. Um, you know, whether you're sitting or you're standing, you're still being sedentary, right? Um, it's non-movement. Um, they're both uh, just as bad for you when used um, alone or um, when you segregate them. So the best thing that you can do is apply both to your workday. And that leads well into uh, physical activity and how you can increase that throughout your workday. Even if you have a job where you're like, I cannot leave my desk, that's okay. There are tools that you can take away from this. Um, if you have the luxury um, like I do where I can leave my desk, you know, and go out into the field or I can leave my desk to talk to a coworker, um, we'll also, um, jump into some recommendations for, for movement in that capacity as well. Okay, so I love the picture on the right because of, of Office Olympics because these are tools that I encourage workplaces um, to use to increase physical activity. You know, whether you're 
part of a wellness program, your workplace has a wellness program, it doesn't have one, but it wants to do something to increase physical activity. These are just some simple things that are free that you can incorporate. So you can do stairwell challenges if you have stairs in your building or in your home, um, walking or standing meetings. And you know, this comes back to, to a culture of that, right? Sometimes, you know, you'll go into workplaces and it's everyone's just sitting down and it's this meeting that seems like it's lasting forever, um, but no one stands, you know, um, just being the, the leader of physical activity, you know, you can stand up and make that, you know, the new office etiquette, you know, you can stand up and stretch. And actually there are studies that have shown that um, by getting up, you know, when you've been sedentary for long periods of time, you're actually more productive. Now that doesn't mean you need to go for a 20 minute run. It just means simply getting up, maybe stretching for a moment and bringing your attention back to the topic or whatever the work is. Um, that your attention should be focused on. Um, you can do a plank challenge. Um, I've seen organizations um, incorporate that into their uh, programming, their wellness programming, um, or squat challenges. Um, when I was at school at Colorado State University, um, there was an organization um, that we were working with where um, there are a lot of trains in Fort Collins, if you're familiar with it. Um, but every time a train would go by their office, everyone in the office, every single person in the office would get up and they would do squats until the train passed. Um, so I thought that that was, um, that was a great idea that I hadn't thought of before. But really anything that promotes movement, you don't need a professional or a specialist um, to tell you what type of activities to incorporate. Um, you're the best judge of your workspace culture and, and what would work and what wouldn't. So be creative with it. Um, but also, you know, I've seen success in um, individuals or organizations who have set goals um, and when they incorporate some sort of healthy competition um, into the workspace. And what I mean by healthy competition is, you know, maybe everyone gets the prize or, or in that way, but it can also be a healthy competition for health, if that makes sense. Okay, so let's just take a couple moments to apply it. Um, so does your organization already support physical activities at work? If so, what types of activities um, do they support? And then what are some simple ways that you can increase physical activity in your workplace? So I'll chime in here, generally while yeah. people are chatting into the box. Um, <clears throat> our organization definitely supports it. We have a lot of um, folks who like to go definitely for walking meetings or even during the nice summertime, um, we have like a running club. So over kind of the lunch hour or different times, really, whenever works for the group, um, they'll go out and they'll take a run um, just to kind of reinvigorate themselves and feel energized again. That's great. And I'm loving the comments um, that I'm seeing. Those are all great ideas. Um, we have um, where I'm at. So I'm at Denver Public Works. We have an on-site gym as well. And before I started working there, I'm like, wow, that's so great. There's an on-site gym. I can't wait to use it. But what I've come to find, so I work out in that gym every day, usually, normally every day during my lunch break, but it's the same thing three people that I see every single day. And unfortunately, I don't think very many people are utilizing our on-site gym. So what our wellness programming um, is working toward is increasing um, the participation in our on-site gym. So if you guys have great um, ideas for what's worked um, for your participation for your on-site gym, let me know and I'll bring it to, uh, to our wellness programming. So this works both ways. Well, if I could chime in there, one, I've heard an organization say um, that people felt intimidated. They didn't know how to like use the um, equipment. And so they kind of paid for a person to come in and just do a couple demos and make sure that everyone felt comfortable if they did want to go and use the equipment. Um, I know that even for myself, if I go into a gym and I'm like, well, that machine looks cool, but I don't want to spend five minutes trying to figure it out. So that could be, you know, an opportunity. To oh, that's great. Yes. I, I didn't even think about that. Thank you for that, Keely. Yeah, I love seeing what people are saying. So I, uh, I love the yoga Tai Chi exercise. That's really great. Yeah, that is great. Stay tuned. We'll do a little exercise in just a moment, everyone. That's awesome. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, so I'd like to briefly touch on wrist health um, because I hear commonly um, people say, and especially I would say this was more common like 10 or 15 years ago, my desk, my typing is giving me carpal tunnel. So um, that is most commonly not the case. Um, usually carpal tunnel um, is caused by very vigorous repetitive motion, such as jackhammering. So if you did that in a previous job and you're now experiencing carpal tunnel, it may be attribu attributable to that rather than uh, your computer. But I will say this, I mean, if your hands have so many fine bones, right? So it's important to neutralize your wrist um, when you're typing, especially if you type for you know over 70% of your day, um, you may feel some fatigue um, in your wrists um, or your fingers. So I'm um, neutralizing your palms. So you can see um, on the picture here, I hope you guys can see my mouse um, right here. This is a neutral wrist. Um, a lot of people, I would say most commonly, um, invert their wrists or their finger, their fingers fingers inward. So it's just, it just comes back to being mindful, guys. You're mindful about your posture. You're mindful about your wrist being neutral. Um, I have questions about tilted keyboards or um, what people are calling ergonomic keyboards where they're, you know, different shapes and sizes and curves. Um, I just recommend having a plain old, plain Jane basic keyboard um, that's flat on the desk and then just neutralizing your wrist, having your arm rest, and then you'll be good to go. Um, your mouse, I understand mouse, uh, mice come in different shapes and sizes. Um, so also you want a neutral wrist. So if you have a mouse that's pretty um, promount, pronounced and wide and it's cocking your wrist, um, maybe consider purchasing a smaller mouse um, that's flatter. Um, I find the flatter the mouse, the more comfortable um, my personal wrist is. Um, and then you can see finally on the bottom, um, I don't recommend the tilted keyboards um, simply for this reason, from these angles that it encourages your wrist uh, to take. So that's where I'll leave it on wrist health. Um, if you have any specific questions about that, I'd be happy to answer them um, after the presentation. Okay, so I'd like to spend just a couple moments um, doing some stretch and strength drills um, with you all so you all can uh, participate in this. Um, so the first thing that you'll do is um, bring your hands together to a prayer position. So your elbows are out wide, um, so your hands are just even um, with your heart space and they're away from your chest. Good. So then what you'll do is bring your elbows to touch. And Kaylee, you know, it actually might be easier if I just turn on the video for this and maybe they can see me doing the stretches. Um, why don't we do that? Um, do you know how or do you want me to? No, it? will you turn it on for me? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Not a problem. Thanks for your patience, guys. I just figured it would be a little easier if I showed you. That's weird. It's making me ask you to, there we go. <laughs> I got it. Okay. All right. So, and I'm freezing in here, so I apologize for the vest and scarf and everything. Okay. So I'm trying to put myself in the center of the screen. So you'll start with your hands in prayer, spread your fingertips out wide. So that's what they look like from the side and then slowly spread your elbows wide and then you'll feel the stretch right there. And then you can do that as many times as you'd like. I would recommend at least six times of that slow and controlled. Okay, so then for the second one is reverse prayer. So you'll just do the same thing behind your back. You'll pull your hands together and then hold here. So you'll feel how that widens through your chest and through your collarbones. And um, then the next one is extended arms. So you'll extend your arm out, your palm is up, and then you'll press your fingers gently toward your body. Good. So there shouldn't be any sharp pain. If there is, um, I would maybe skip this exercise, but it's just pretty gentle, just gentle pressure, just stretching. And you'll do that with both hands. Okay, the next, hold on, it's loading. Um, oh, there we go. Then a desk press. So what you'll do, so it's hard for me to show this over the video, but flat palm, grab beneath your desk if you're at one, just where you're sitting. So your palms are up under your desk, and then you'll press up and hold for about five to five to 10 seconds, and then you'll release, and then just do the same thing again. And once again, I'd recommend just six repetitions of that. But the more you can do, the better. Okay, and then if you have a stress ball or a tennis ball, that's a great exercise. You can hold it, you can squeeze it, do one palm at a time. You can also do that while you're reading something or working. 
and then thumb resistance. So um, you'll give me a thumbs up and then gently, so gently with this one, guys, you'll pull with your other palm, just press your thumb toward your face. Good, so it's really gentle. I'm not forcing this at all. It doesn't take much for you to feel it. And then you'll just do it with the other side. Thumbs up, gently pull it toward your face. Good. And then uh, figure eight. So you'll interlace your grip like this, and then you'll just create a figure eight with your wrist. Good, and even what I would recommend doing while, you, while you're moving through these exercises, you know, take what, what works and leave what doesn't. Um, you know, you can stand up while you're doing it, um, move around a little bit, just encourages more physical activity when you get up. Okay, then overhead reach. You'll reach your arms up high, palms are up, drag your shoulders down away from your ears. Good, and then low belly up and in. That supports and protects your low spine. And then it's like you're stamping your handprint into the ceiling. Okay, and then you can play around with that. You can take a side body stretch to the right or to the left, and you can play around with that. So those are just a few helpful tips um, that you can start using right away um, throughout your workday. So whether you're sitting or you're stand standing, I find those pretty helpful. Um, so Kaylee, you can just go ahead and um, stop my video. Okay. And then we'll move on. Oh, and the last one is um, eagle arms. You just cross your right elbow under your left and then you switch it the other way. That stretches your back line. Thank you. Okay, so in summary, the single most important factor for health in the office is activity. Any way that you can incorporate physical activity um, is good for you. Um, I recommend using a combination of both sitting and standing throughout the day. So um, like we talked about, one or the other, um, you're still being sedentary. When you incorporate both, um, your, it encourages movement. Um, keeping your wrists in a neutral position while working at your desk um, and stretching, right? Use some of those stretches that we talked through. Um, there are plenty of other stretches if you get tired of those, if those stretches um, and strength drills um, didn't work for you. Um, many other options. You can reach out to me individually um, or you can uh, just Google them and, and there are plenty of other uh, things you can do. Um, and then exercise outside of work and um, try to meet those CDC guidelines. Um, so like I said, 120 minutes um, cardio, um, they just classify it as anything over a brisk walk and then some musculoskeletal um, strengthening. So um, lifting some light weights, um, things of that nature. Um, it's just moderate to vigorous uh, physical activity. Um, but it, Really, it starts with you. Um, you know, you can't wait for your coworker um, to start incorporating these into their workplace. Um, you've got to be the leader for this. And, and it really starts with watching this webinar and just becoming aware of some of these things. Um, Kaylee, we switched to the next slide. Sorry, it's just not working for me. All right. Thanks. And so for individual recommendations, I recommend getting up to move at least once every 60 minutes. Um, for those of you that have Fitbits, um, you know, I don't recommend that you need to go buy a Fitbit, but I know the newer versions of the Fitbits do um, vibrate or buzz um, when it's time for you to get up and move. And I'm pretty sure they do it once every hour. So, so I like that tool, whether you need, you know, an alarm on your phone or you like using the activity tracking devices, whatever helps you to get up and move, um, I encourage you to use it. Um, and then stand up and walk meetings when possible. I mean, Kaylee mentioned um, that at um, Health Links and the Center for Health, Work, and Environment, I mean, I know this from personal experience, they're excellent about taking um, walk meetings when they're possible. Um, I understand there are some meetings that require your attention at a computer, but um, walk meetings are great. Um, and also if you can stand up and stretch. Um, and then outside or inside the workplace, stretches and exercises that open the front line of your body, you know, so broadening through your chest, opening through your collarbones, and then strengthening the back line. So, you know, you can do back extensions, reverse flies, um, anything with rowing, um, good for strengthening the back line. And then for organizational recommendations, um, I talked a little bit about incorporating a culture of physical activity. Um, like I mentioned, uh, the organization does the squats every time the train goes by. Maybe you can find a way to incorporate that into something that works uh, for you. 
Um, and then you can also develop informational flyers, you know, make it relatable. You know, it's only a half mile to walk around the building. You know, did you know um, you can walk to Sprouts in 15 minutes? Um, so it's a 30 minute walk when you go get your lunch. Um, just making it relatable and um, making it sound easier to achieve um, when you post it on a flyer. Um, but also probably the most important thing is getting employee feedback on wellness activity and initiatives. You know, what, what's working in in my organization at Denver Public Works, you know, may not be working in your organization, may not work for you because, you know, you have different individuals there, a different culture there. So getting employee feedback on what they would participate in um, is essential. Thanks. And then lastly, I just want to talk to you guys about um, redesign. So office redesign does not need to be expensive. Um, here are some helpful tips that you can do to increase physical activity. Um, so firstly, if you have a recycling bin, a trash can at your desk, I recommend moving it to or getting rid of it. Um, by getting rid of it, then you can just use a community trash space because it encourages you to get up and move and walk to, you know, recycle your paper or walk to throw away your trash um, from leftover lunch, whatever it is. Um, but also drink a lot of water because when you drink a lot of water, you need to go to the bathroom more often, which means that you need to get up from your desk. Um, more frequently. Um, but also, and what I like in this picture is plant life. Um, plant life is proven to increase um, happiness or joy in an office workspace, um, but it also encourages you to, to go outside um, and experience uh, nature, right? Uh, nature is so good for the soul. What is it, Kaylee, that you guys do, the Shinrin Yoku? Yes, yeah. Yeah, so it's called forest bathing, and um, and they just go take a hike. They they actually get a full work day off to to go hike and enjoy uh, nature and and do their forest bathing. So I, I know like I am not fortunate enough to have a forest bathing day, and many of you probably aren't either. But um, you know you can do that in your off work time or during your lunch. Um, but those are just a, a few tips uh, to help you out. Um, but with that said, um, there's a handout um, that Kaylee will attach to the follow-up email about workstation adjustments. Um, you guys, my contact information is at the end of this um, webinar. Please feel free to reach out to me. You can call me or email me. Um, I'd be happy to help you out. Um, if you have ideas um, that you think that I haven't thought of yet, um, please share them with me. Um, I like to um, look at this as a two-way street. So thank you very much, and I will uh, take your questions if you have any. Yes, there were some, so I was going to um, hold those up. Um, this one was actually interesting to me. I hadn't heard of it yet. Have you, are you familiar with a vertical mouse? Um, someone mentioned that she's now using it due to wrist pain and it alleviated the pain that she was having. Yeah, that's so funny that you brought up the vertical mouse. So I haven't, I haven't used one myself. So, and I haven't even seen one in person. So I can't tell you um, what my personal opinion is about it yet. I just saw, I think it was on LinkedIn. Someone was like, I just got a vertical mouse. And so I am very curious um, to try one. Um, like I said, you know, as long as you're keeping your wrist neutral and if it's alleviating some of that wrist pain that you were experiencing, then um, it sounds like maybe it's a good fit for you. And are you aware of any apps that can help with either reminders or stretches that are on it um, or anything to promote movement that's on like a phone app? Oh, um, I don't have any off the top of my head. I am sure that those exist. Um, I would say that's probably just a quick Google search to say like, quick stretch app um, and, and something would come up, but I haven't used one personally. Okay. Um, there is a question for standing desks. If you have an anti-fatigue mat, is it best to be barefoot? Oh, um, you don't have to be barefoot. Um, I know that there's, you know, that could be um, a hot topic in the office. If you can be barefoot, I mean, great. Um, and, and here's my thing on feet. Uh, I'll just talk about this briefly. I, I'll try not to make it a tangent. Um, shoes, of course, are great for your feet. They're supportive, but it's also good for you to be barefoot because it allows your toes to stretch out and um, the surface area of the sole of your foot to widen. So if you can be barefoot for part of your day, um, that's great. I'm not 
saying that that needs to be in the workplace. Um, what I like to do is grab, and this is what I do with my standing desk, is I use a golf ball or a tennis ball, and I have it on my anti-fatigue mat, and I just use, um, sometimes I'll take off my shoe and, you know, have a bare, barefoot or a sock, and I just rub the ball along the sole of my foot um, for myofascial release. Um, I don't have time to go into myofascial release, but you can just quickly Google that, or you can give me a call after this presentation. I'll explain it to you. Um, but that is um, very good for your foot to do that. Um, so I have a follow-up question to that, and then I see another one that came in, but you know, we have the sit stand desks and you were able to also use those. And it sounds like now you have the ability as well, but you also have an anti fatigue mat. So I'm curious if you've noticed that difference and if that's something you would recommend our team looking into. I would recommend it. Um, because, and to give you all background for those of you who are watching, when I worked at the center, um, they're, they're so fortunate enough to have, um, great standing desks for, for everyone. They're automatic standing desks or electric. And um, there aren't any anti-fatigue mats um, since, and then now at my workplace, I have a standing desk, but I also have an anti-fatigue mat. And I will say this, I use my standing desk a lot more now than I did um, at Health Links and at the center. And honestly, I can attribute that to uh, the anti-fatigue mat because I my legs are just feeling like I can stand longer um, than I could there. I felt myself becoming fatigued uh, more quickly um, when I didn't have it. Okay, thank you. Um, and this question is, can you share some first steps when implementing a shared treadmill workstation? Um, maybe around permission from risk management or waivers, things of the sort, if you're familiar. Yes, yeah, so there aren't many, many workplaces that, um, that I have um, worked with or been in contact with that have incorporated treadmill um, workstations, but um, the couple that have, um, that I've talked to, they have incorporated a sign up for it. Um, and it's just about rotation. I'm not sure how many people um, would be sharing this workstation. Of course, that is something that you would have to take into account. You know, if there were only five people, of course, you could just probably talk in a meeting about, you know, rotating times to use the, the treadmill desk. If there are about 30 people maybe in your office or more that are trying to share it, um, I'm unfamiliar with um, what other organizations are doing. And maybe Kaylee, I'm not sure if you've heard anything from HealthLink's businesses about this, but um, I would say a sign up would probably be your best bet or even just oh, if you have wellness meetings or, or an area that you can just um, connect about the use of that, um, of that uh, treadmill desk. Yeah, um, I'd love to connect with you, Christine, offline. I can think of a couple of other organizations in our network that have you have the, the treadmill desks and stuff. And so I'd love to connect you all and kind of pick each other's brains on what the best practices are. And then you can share that with me. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I don't see any other questions coming in. Um, and so if, if you have questions, please continue to type them in, but I'll just quickly go through the last um, things. As you can see here, our next webinar is November 14th, and this is a really important one if you're in our network or want to join Health Links um, to attend because it's going to go through all of our updates to our um, program. So we are going to be launching some new features and having a website redesign and some really awesome stuff that go hand in hand with the national expansion that we uh, announced at our annual event. And so our director, Lily Tenney, is going to be presenting on all our updates and exciting news. Um, and I think it'd be a really great time for you to get any questions answered or just see the new features and become familiar with them. Um, so that's the link to register. And again, these slides will be sent out. Um, and let's see. So if you aren't currently uh, recognized as a certified healthy workplace, please um, contact us. If you have any questions, we're happy to walk you through it or discuss anything. You can view the assessment online and download the PDF, um, but we're always here to help. So don't hesitate to contact us. 
Um, and then if you are looking to kind of take a little bit of a deeper dive and help us contribute to science and the research and then back to practice when we share these tips and tricks with you guys, um, please join our small safe well study, which um, uses or is testing health links as an intervention as well as some added cool components like an employee culture survey and a total worker health leadership uh, training. And um, my last plug will just be if you want to become a Health Links ambassador. If you are excited about healthy workplaces like myself and Jenna Lee, then um, join our ambassador group and help us spread the word that we're a tool that workplaces can use and promote the resources that we have for them. And I'd love to get in touch with all of you about that further. These are our um, handles, so stay connected with us. And like I mentioned before, I will be sending around the, the quick survey, just a rating scale for you. And then that'll also have the attachment with the um, PDF of the slides and the link to the YouTube video. Thanks everyone for joining us. And thank you so much, Janalee. This was, I heard you present before, but I feel like I learned even more stuff again today. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Have a good one, everyone.